All right. How's everybody doing? Um, our last guest today is Chris Milk. Thank you for joining us, Chris. You're welcome. Uh, Chris is the founder and CEO of Verse. Um, but I think probably more aptly, aptly he is a, um, he's a video maker, a fine artist, and uh, ultimately now a VR storyteller. Um, but before we really get into Verse, I want to kind of remind people of uh, where you come from, which is to say that um, you first came to prominence directing music videos, right, for Kanye West and, and Modest Mouse and Green Day. And I think we have uh, the first clip is actually some of your videos, if we uh, want to play that. Is that? I think they can roll it. Uh, so let me ask you, what drew you to making music videos? Um, it started when I was a, when I was a kid. I, w I, I was, it's weird, I was in love with music. Um, there was nothing that touched me deeper, affected me more. And I thought that if I added other things on top of the music, I could make the feelings even more powerful. Um, so as a kid, I, I didn't have a guitar, I didn't have a piano. My parents weren't musicians, but my grandfather had a, a VHS camcorder. And I started making music videos um, with my little brother and I around the house. And that eventually translated into a, a career making music videos. But it, it, but it never, the problem was it, it never quite uh, equated the the raw emotional power of just pure music. Um, and that led to sort of searching through other new technologies to try to figure out if there was another way to do it. Um, when you say that it didn't capture the power of music, you, you, you mean at an emotional level for you? You didn't feel like yeah. the, the, just the pure visual storytelling was? Yeah. getting where you wanted to go? There's something, there's something about it's the right song at the right time is more powerful, I think, than, than any other form of media. When that one song happens, when you hear that one song that just connects with you, um, I mean, there, there's, something, there's something more visceral that happens with music that I think happens even with, with, with cinema. Although I think cinema is the, still the, the gold standard of visual storytelling. Music um, connects to a deeper place, which like when you hear a song um, from that one summer with that one girl, you, you're instantly transported back there. But when you see the movie from that one summer, you're not instantly transported right. back there in the same way. So I think it's, it's going deeper and it's residing in a deeper emotional place inside of us. And then you, you so you also, um, you then worked in collaboration with your now longtime collaborator, Aaron Koblin, and Google Creative Labs. I believe it was first on the Johnny Cash project, right? Yeah. That you worked on. And how did that, how did, well, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about what the Johnny Cash project was. And I think that that's the next. Uh... The Johnny Cash project was, essentially what you're seeing here is the output of the project. The, the, the project lives no online as a website. And people go to it and draw individual frames of this music video. So every single frame you're seeing is something that someone spent many hours constructing through a interactive digital drawing tool um, online. And it was it was something that um so I was I was searching for these new different technologies trying to figure out other ways I could tell stories that maybe would affect you as deeply as music had affected me and um, as pure music had affected me. And um, I ran into Aaron. He was doing interesting things around crowdsourcing. Um, he had he had done um, a, a really amazing video with uh, with Radiohead with another director where they use lasers, lighter laser scanning. And we started talking about what could we do together. We met in a conference in Portugal, like a technology art conference that we were both speakers at. And, uh, and by the end of it, we had this idea for this piece that would be this communal work of art made by hundreds of thousands or millions of people around the world. And, but we didn't have an artist. And, uh, and then I ran into Rick Rubin and he told me how he was finishing the final Johnny Cash project. And when he played it for me, it was so extraordinary because the the um, 
The chorus is, when I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna rise right out of the ground. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. So Johnny is singing about his own mortality, his own resurrection, and, and ultimately his own eternal life. And the way that he achieves that eternal life is through all the hearts and minds of all the people around the world that he's touched. And this project became the physical manifestation of all of that love around the world coming together to, to make his final, his final performance. And then, um, and then you guys went on from there to do uh, the Arcade Fires, the Wilderness Downtown, which I think... Um, yeah, so this one, um, with Johnny Cash Project, it required an incredible amount of work on the front end for a very small piece of you in the, in the final piece right. at the end. And what I wanted to try to do is flip the math so there's a tiny piece of input from you can make a tremendous amount of you inside of it. So it asks you for your address where you grew up at the beginning, and it pulls Google Street View and Google Maps imagery and produces this film to an Arcade Fire track that you see this figure running down the street, and when he stops in front of a house, you realize the street that he's running down was your childhood street, and it's your home that he stops in front of. Um, and then all this other madness happens with trees exploding out of your street and such. Um, but it was, it, was, um, it was personalized, you know, yeah. it was, it was uh, somewhat interactive, extremely personalized and personal. Um, but it was also, I was very much feeling, or we were very much feeling the constraints of the medium that we were working in, which was the internet, which sure. while it's, we can connect you to other people, we can connect you to powerful data sets that exist like this one, probably like the most powerful data set like from an emotional standpoint is your childhood home. Yeah, and I, I remember seeing it for the first time and having that same, I, mean, I grew up in a small town I never go back to, so it was like, wow, that's incredible. Um, that's cool. Um, so, <laughs> but we, we're still like stuck inside this rectangle. Um, I mean, we, we, the first problem was like everybody has a different computer with Chrome browsers that haven't been right. updated sure. and, or not even a Chrome browser, um, you know, some Internet Explorer 95 yeah, yeah. and it doesn't play. So we were, we were frustrated with the confinements of people's existing computational architecture that they had on their desk. And then we were also just frustrated by you're, you're still looking at this thing yeah, through, through this, a rectangle. This, this little rectangle on your, um, on your desk. Um, so it sounds like you're still you're making music videos. That's not satisfying you. This, you, you. You go further with this. That's still not satisfying. So you keep pushing? Yeah. So, I mean, at this point, it's not even about the music video anymore. It's more utilizing the, the budgets that we could get for music videos to make cool, interactive um, projects. Um, but then we started thinking about like how to, well the way to put you deeper is to make something in a room, in a, in a museum is why we started yeah, making I that. I think I have that. This is so a, this is, if this is the next slide, so this is called the Treachery of Sanctuary. Can you turn up the volume on this? There's a triptych, this is the third panel. And there's a reflecting pool in front of this kid and that's one, that's a third panel in front of him. So this, so now I've got interactivity and I've got immersion and the, and the, the reactions, the emotional reactions that I saw people having to this work and others that Aaron and I built in other museums was so far beyond what we'd, we'd seen people having to the things that we made inside of rectangles. Um, if you can put someone inside of the work, if you can immerse them, that they feel like it's all around them, it just, it, it goes to a deeper place. It's not observational uh -huh. anymore. Um, it's not an external, an external medium or story that people are witnessing and translating. Um, it becomes your part of it. Now this is very rudimentary. It's extremely simple. 
but I saw people like running around and laughing and rolling on the ground and swinging each other <laughs> and getting on each other's shoulders. And it was just, it was so emotional. The first day we erected, I, I, I sat there for the entire day in a dark corner just watching people go through it and I couldn't believe it in my eyes. Um, the problem is you've got interactivity, you've got, um, you've got immersion, but you don't have scalability. Um, right. And, and you know, six people at a time can go inside of this. You could build it in another room and 12 people could be in it. We want 12 mil million people at one time. And there's just no way to do that when you're building rooms for places. And so how quickly does that lead you to VR? When did you discover VR as a, as a way of getting what you were seeking? I mean, it was, it was the logical solution. Um, at the time, it didn't exist. This was before, um, before, I mean, it existed, but it existed in labs and universities and, 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 oh. and with the military. Um, uh, this was before Oculus had their Kickstarter. And we, we just started trying to figure out how to do oh. it and realized it, making hardware is really complicated. <laughs> sure. um, and in the process of searching, um, found uh, a guy named Mark Bolas's lab at USC, uh, and there was a, an, an artist there named Noni de, Pe Noni de la Pena that had a, a project that she had built in VR. Um, it was very low resolution. Uh, it was called Hunger in Los Angeles, and you can sort of, it's, it's, it looks like, um, at the time anyway, it looked like kind of like a, a Dire Straits Money for Nothing video, like very blocky yeah, characters, yeah, sure. but you could walk around inside of them. You could interact, um, but it was, it was like, this is, this is it. This is the thing that I've been looking for. I can feel it in my bones. It's the immersion, it's scalability, um, because if you have headsets everywhere, you build one experience and it can be distributed to people around the world. Um, so Met also there was, um, was uh, Palmer Lucky building his first Oculus. And so we, we saw firsthand what they were doing um, when he did the Kickstarter, when it was oversubscribed, um, and, and then started, then I started trying to figure out how do I add something, like the things that I've been making. I wasn't interested in making a video game. But back back yeah, then, yeah. It, the conversation was very much about this being the evolution of video games. And at, at the time, for me, I thought maybe it was the evolution of cinema. My, my thinking has sort of evolved since then. Um, but I started trying to make that were more like films in VR. What's that like? What is, what is the difference between trying to direct something for a rectangle, as you put it, and trying to direct something for an immersive VR experience? Um, it's, it's, it's really different. The, 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 as a filmmaker, you have the power of this frame. You have people's captives, captive attention, as, lo as long as you can continue to get them to keep looking at your frame. But you know, if you look at a typical scene in a movie, you start with a wide shot, you cut in to a, to a medium shot, then there's over the shoulders and the Basically, I'm taking your consciousness or your view and I'm moving it around in, in 24 frames per second. In, in one frame, I can move you from a wide shot to a close up. Right. I have complete control over your view. I see what you, I, I let you see what I want you to see when I want you to see it in the way that I want you to see it. And in virtual reality, you don't have that. You are immersing people in a world. Um, and it's much more of a choreography of a, of a viewer's, an audience's attention than it is, um, than you have this, this frame. But what you lose, you gain exponentially more. Because, what, do you, what do you mean? Well, you, you lose the ability to show people exactly what you want them to see, but you allow them to be within the world. Uh -huh. And that's, that's, that's really different than any other medium that we've had before. Every other medium is, is externalized. Externalized consciousness. It is a filmmaker's vision being translated into a rectangular screen, and you witness it, and you interpret it and you internalize it, but there's always this translation gap right. that's there. You read words of an author on a page you, and, you, and, and you imagine what it would be like. It can be exactly as the author 
imagine it, but you imagine something similar. But there's always, there's always a, a translation of an author's expression of an experience that's happening. You're not experiencing it yeah, firsthand. Sure. This, is the me this medium is, is you experiencing, not an experience, but, a, but experiencing the firsthand experience. Um, it is a medium not of celluloid or ink on parchment. Um, it, is, it is a medium of human experience. The paint on the, the paint is human experience. The this is your consciousness. Did it, um, I mean, did you have to come to this realization or did you find it fairly intuitive? I mean, did you make mistakes along the way? Were you trying things that didn't work or, and what kinds yeah. of things, what, what kind of things did you do that you were like, oh wait, this isn't. <laughs> um, the first things that happened, we, we made this film um, called Sound and Vision with, with Back um, before even the first Oculus was released yet. And I didn't, I didn't, I, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't even have a headset. We're basically, I was shooting this thing blind for a medium that I thought it would work in without actually, you could see yeah. it through. And um, I, it was three cameras and two of the cameras were moving on robotic dollies. And, um, and we, we, we finished it and, it, and, and the Oculus guys were nice enough to give me an early headset and, um, and it worked. And, and then uh, best, rule, best rules of virtual reality practices came out. And the first, or not maybe the first, but one of the first rules was don't move the camera. I'm like, huh, well, that's weird, because we're moving the camera and it doesn't seem to be a problem. Okay? Yeah, the idea is if you move, that, that movement will make people sick. Right. Uh, and the reason that that is is because your brain is constantly checking what your eyes and your inner vestibular system is telling it to make sure that they correspond. And when they don't, your brain thinks that you've eaten something poisonous and you're hallucinating and it makes you sick so that you throw up the, whatever the poison is that you ate that day. Um, so, if the, the thinking is that if you are seeing movement but your vestibular system is not telling your brain that your body is moving, that you will get nauseous. The loophole that we inadvertently discovered was that um, if you have motion that is constant and in a single direction, your, your vestibular system is not great at sensing that kind of motion, which is why when you're in an airplane going many hundred miles an hour, you don't feel like you are. Um, when you take off, when you accelerate and you right. de-accelerate, de you, you do feel that. Sure. So, well, so, okay, so now we've got a rule. Um, don't do, ex do, don't do acceleration, don't do deacceleration. stay constant with motion. We got away with it. Um, but, you know, film school, they teach you, you have to learn the rules and then you're allowed to break them. Right. So, to break them, to see, like, okay, what, what, what can we do with this creatively if we tweak it? And there's a film um, that I made called Evolution of Verse where uh, your perspective lifts up off the ground into the sky and into space, essentially. And I could have made the move happen, your movement from zero to 60 go in one the frame. Next one we have too. Oh, really? I might be wrong. <laughs> might. So you go from Is this. Oh, yeah. I don't know if it'll get to the part where there, there's a move, though. Well, it's they just can, a big They can at least get the gist train. of it while yeah. uh, explaining. So, so after this giant train comes barreling toward you, and, and by the way, like this is the worst possible way to watch anything in virtual reality, is on a giant television screen. So um, I think they're doing demos out there if anyone's interested. But we... So I came from zero to 60 in one frame, basically, like instant speed, right? That's digital, that particular one is CGI. But what I did was I put a little bit of acceleration as you lift up, because I want you to get a little bit of a twist in your stomach, because what you're seeing is you flying up off the ground. So I, 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 want, I want to work in the same way that a great composer would make the swings, I mean, the strings well as you know, the as the hero comes up over the mountain, um, this is a new tool that I have that I can actually, I can make you feel something using by breaking the rules. Yeah. Of discovering. 
And did you have a moment, you know, you've described VR as um, an empathy engine, and you described it just now as um, sort of ex like having a, um, experiencing something else within, like, like being in an, inside a different experience. About when that sort of hits you as an artist, that that um, this is that like your your empathy levels are raised and you're inside an experience, and yeah. that's and that's really the word you're using rather than you know filmmaker, for example. Um, yeah, I mean we 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 still throw around the word filmmaker and films, and it's wrong because this isn't cinema. Even cinema doesn't even use film anymore, so it's like. True. It's two steps removed from what it is, but we haven't come up with a better term. And every time you come up with a better term, it sounds silly if you just make something up. The human experiences is what we've been using lately. Um, but uh, I, I think that the, the first moment was in the thing that I did with Beck. Um, there was an audience, and we had this camera roaming around through the audience, and there was a strange camera system that was on it with this weird looking microphone that we built. And staring at the camera as it went by. And in the virtual reality experience, you'd turn around and, and someone would be looking at you and it was like, it was electric. And you felt a connection to this person and you were looking back at them. And that, there is something extremely primal about sitting in each other's company and eye contact. Um, and even though this, I can't interact with this person, in this film, in this VR film, present day anyway, with the current technology, I can't interact with them. The connection of our eyes meeting each other was so powerful and unlike anything I'd ever seen in any other form of media, including, including cinema. In cinema, a, an actor looking at the camera is just breaking the fourth wall. It doesn't feel like they're looking at you, but this was this person was looking at me and I was looking back at them. And a lot of people have come out of the experiences and said, there's, there, the kids were looking up at me and I felt so uncomfortable I had to look away. I couldn't keep eye contact with huh. them. I mean, is that another rule? The, the, something about the close-up of the power in, in the power of VR? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the close-up, for instance, is, is no longer close-up. A close-up is you are physically close to a person and that has, that has incredible power. I mean, my, my, my theory is that we came from caves and then we moved to tribes and clans and villages and towns and now we're globally connected, but there's still something to our core that makes us care about the things that are immediately local to us. And the one, of, one power of virtual reality is that it can make any place, any person, and any story local to you. And can you talk a little bit, because we t you, you talk about making the video for Beck and and uh, the evolution of Verse with the train and the stuff exploding. But, but um, Verse is obviously well known for a lot of, I guess, you know, this is still the right term for documentary work, for nonfiction work. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the difference between the, you know, or, or the power of true storytelling of, of documentary work in VR and, and, and what the relationship between fiction and nonfiction is in VR as you see it. So I think the first thing to understand is that we're in essentially year two of experimenting with storytelling in virtual reality. Uh -huh. um, uh, so to say we're still learning would be an understatement. Um, documentary is an easy entry point where if you're going to make people immersed someplace, bringing them to that place where that place is real, and there's inherent truth pouring forth from that place, um, that's easier than manufacturing it. So, uh, you know, a documentary is people going to, to a world and, and, and telling a story that's, that's actually happening. A fictional film is crafted, every scene or recorded actors are pretending to be right. things that they're not. They're saying lines in the most real way that they can. Um, that a, write, a writer has written um, months before. Um, it, it is an incredibly well-told lie, beautiful, beautiful lie that has touched me incredibly deeply. But 
it's manufactured, it's constructed. Right. So when we start making virtual reality films two years ago, two and a half years ago, we start with making things, we start by shooting things that are real. Because we're not sure how to make things that seem real. Right. Um, and it's sort of the difference between like, going and pl pulling something out of a garden that's grown organically on its own versus like trying to manufacture something completely from scratch. But I do think that is the future. Um, and we're working on a number of projects right now. So do you around feel like that's harder films. to do fictional? It's, it's definitely harder. Um, but, it's, but it's totally surmountable. It's just gonna take experimentation. Um, what's interesting is even just in, in early experiments, uh, the the style of acting seems like it's going to need to change. Right. We're working with real actors in the future, um, but in our early experiments, what you see is, in the same way that theatrical uh, theater acting, when uh, when we moved to cinema, had to adjust because um, at the time, the acting was to reach the back row, and now suddenly you have a close up and your face is 20 feet on a giant screen, you don't need to give the same level of performance. Um, we're seeing something similar, translating cinema performances into virtual reality, um, and we think it's, it's because your, your bullshit is just way higher when you're sitting with someone. Yeah. If they're acting, you feel it. If they're acting up here, you don't feel it as much. Interesting. So the level of performance really needs to be um, invisible. It needs to feel like this is a real person that's acting in a completely um, real. The other problem is uh, you can't cut. You shoot a movie, you'll shoot 10 takes of one scene and you'll cut the performance to make it what you want it to be in an edit. In virtual reality, you're trying to get stuff in one shot. Right. And getting performances in one shot is not the easiest thing to do. And you feel, is there trouble like getting people to focus where you want them to focus? I mean, you have a lot of control as a traditional filmmaker on a 2D screen, but getting, like how do you get people to look where you want them to look? Um, there's a lot of different ways. Um, there's, basically you're guiding their attention, so you can catch their attention around. Uh -huh. um, we did a, a U2 film where the people are coming in all around you and you, you'll be looking in this direction, you'll hear somebody singing over here and you'll turn around and you'll find them. Uh, you can use it using light, you can use it using gaze of a character that you're looking at. Um, there's a tendency for people to get inside and start looking all around like crazy because they've never seen anything like this before. I think there's a, there will be a natural sort of state of rhythm that evolves as people get more exposed to this and have more experience with it, that you, your attention will be drawn to where your attention is. We're sitting here on stage, you're not looking around like crazy behind you, you're looking at me because I'm hopefully compelling your attention. Sure. The same will be true in, in, in VR. People will look around like crazy and eventually they'll settle in. So Cardboard's out, the Oculus is out now, the, the Vive's out. Um, and in, in we hear about VR everywhere. Do you think, I mean, are we starting to, um, is VR starting to be overhyped? Um, so there's, there's something called the, the hype cycle. And I think we're, we're definitely on the trajectory of it right now. Um, the, here's here's what, what you have to really think about though is right now there's this, there's this, um, all this excitement and virtual reality is this buzzword. It's the, all these headsets are coming out for the Christmas. How many headsets are we gonna sell in 2016 and is it gonna be the next Teddy Ruxpin of our generation? That's the wrong way to look at it. Um, it's, not, it's not the evolution of video games. It's not the evolution of, of cinema. It is a wholly and unique medium in its embryonic form right now. But it is also the, for, the first iteration, the first outgrowth, the first, um, the first thing birthed from a, a larger idea, which is the fundamental 
behind it. And if you, the only way to do this, like look historically. So historically, in the in the 1800s, we as a species figure out how to record and broadcast moving picture and sound. Out of that fundamental technology, uh, cinema, television, radio, even the telephone, eventually the internet, basically the modern world that we live in today comes out of those two technologies from 150 years ago. I think that we are at that moment once again with the technology behind it. And virtual reality is just the first thing that we're seeing from it. Because what the technology is, is, is basically tech communicating with our consciousness in the language that our consciousness experiences the world around us, that of human experience. And out of that can grow things that seem like an entertainment platform, but it can also grow communications, um, um, a world-changing shift in the way that not just experience story, but the way that we experience each other. Right. And uh, I understand with that vision that um, verse itself is evolving. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so we've got a, a lot of different things happening today <laughs> for our company. Um, the, the first one is we, we're announcing that we're closing our Series A round led by um, Andreessen Horowitz and participation with 20th, 21st Century Fox, uh, which we are humbled and incredibly excited to be working with partners for them. Andreessen, was actually, Andreessen Horowitz was actually uh, in our original seed round, and they've been amazing um, helping us grow the company. And congratulations. Thank you. Great. It's, uh, it's great to hear that others share the vision, too. It's great to hear that others share the vision, too. Andreessen and 21st Century Fox. Indeed. Um, and the other thing that we've decided to do um, is even more drastic, which is we've decided to to change the name of our company. And for a few different reasons. Um, we, we came up with this really clever idea of pulling out a vowel from a word to make it say VR at the beginning of it. Yeah, VR, S-A, verse. verse. And uh, we thought that was really smart. Um, <laughs> It turns out, uh, when you do that, people that read it don't know how to pronounce it, and people that have heard it and know how to pr pronounce it don't know how to search for it, which are not great features to a name of a company that you're trying to build that people um, And then also, just thinking more, I mean, we've, we've, we've been at this for a few years now, and we've really looked at what my, my thinking has evolved of what this medium is and what it actually means for all of us in the future. Um, and the word virtual reality, to put virtual reality, VR, in our name, I'm not sure that that is a term that we'll even use in 10 years, certainly not to the, to the level that we're using it today. Interesting. Why, why do you think that? Well, I mean, last time you said to someone, hey, did you see that thing on the World Wide Web? Just did you see that thing? Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's, we, we don't, what our mission is, is bigger than a technology and for where we want to go is not about a buzzword. Um, it's, what we're, what we're interested in is, is, the creation and sharing of, of human experience. And is the technology that, but we're really more interested in the humanity of it and what, what the technology makes possible for humanity. Um, so, you Are you ready to this, share the I, new name? Uh, I hate doing this. Um, <laughs> uh, so put it up? So, no. no. So this, <laughs> do 
that. <laughs> so the, here's the, the thinking behind it. Um, this is the this medium is unique because it is no longer external. We are looking through these rectangles for you know thousands yeah. of years, be it books or tablets. I mean tablets. Tablets, not yeah, right. new tablets, um, not iPads. Okay. Movies, movies, television. There's always like through this frame, and and what this what what this medium allows us to do is travel through the frame and live actually within the story. And what's unique about it is that the, the actual medium is because it's no longer in, in, internal. It's actually living living within us. The the as I said the. The paints is human experience. The canvas is our consciousness. There's no externalized representation of it anymore. It is, it is, it is within us. Because of all that, um, we don't remember these things as these films, these experiences, whatever. We'll come up with that name next. We don't, we don't remember them as a piece of media that we consumed. We remember them as. A time and place and story existed within. So, if you didn't figure it out, we're called within now. Congratulations again, Chris, and thanks a lot for being here. Thanks.